Uh, so the Inaris Project is just an open forum for discussion and ideas around a future free from oppression, uh, empire, and war, and things like that. And they welcome activists and scholars to join in that discussion. And you can find information at inarisproject.org. Alex students for another politics, or ASAP, is a student group here on campus. And they align themselves against all forms of oppression, such as race, uh, those related to race, sexual orientation, and uh, socioeconomic status. And they aim to empower the OSU and Corvallis community through direct action and education events such as this one. Um, today our discussion is led by Professor Barbara Maraca. She is uh, in the College of Liberal Arts here at OSU, and she specializes in social philosophy, process thought, and environmental philosophy, which includes the topic of degrowth, which we'll hear more about today. Uh, she's currently focused on things like the global social justice movement and the philosophy behind that and political ecology. She's also the co-director of the IAEP, which is the International Association of Environmental Philosophy, and she was on the planning committee for the International Conference on Degrowth for Ecological Sustainability and Social Equity. And she hopes to bring that conference to the state sometime soon. So after that lengthy introduction, I just have one key point that I want to, to make for right now. Uh, there have been a few key big wins for environmental activists lately, such as the Keystone Pipeline veto and uh, sh Shell backing out of its Arctic drilling. And these things are really worth celebrating, but I want to point out that it was the people on the ground that were resisting these operations that made those things happen. So. Uh, direct action changes the course. So we can't rely on our government to make those changes for us. It sincerely is for all of us to act. So there are a lot of people in the audience today that can be connected with community engagement, and I encourage anybody who doesn't already to, to do so. And please help me welcome Barbara Mark. The things that I have here, um, some of the things that I have written on degrowth, one whole book which is uh, a vocabulary, a degrowth vocabulary, and uh, if you want to take it, and it's just my, it's my only copy, so please give it back to me. And this is in German, uh, but this is a terrific thing that I, I hope it might be some kind of translated into English. It's organized in cooperation with Le Monde Diplomatique, and, and strangely enough, it's only in German because it was the German chapter of Le Monde Diplomatique who organized the Atlas of Globalization. It's all on post growth and degrowth. So if you know anyone who has money and interest to do with it in English, that would be great. I don't. <laughs> so if anyone wants to take the books and carry them moving around, that's, uh, you know, if you're interested to know more about that. So it's a great pleasure being here. I think this lecture series was amazing. And uh, so I'd say the great honor to be the last speaker in, in such an incredible series. And I have so much to say, and I will try to uh, leave space for discussion. In fact, let's start from what is more uh, on the agenda, which is uh, climate change. And you know that on November 30th in Paris, there will be the COP meeting. And already they're kind of uh, reducing the freedom uh, of the people for the reasons that we know in terms of the People's Summit, uh, which is usually organized around the core of the COP meeting, is being uh, dramatically limited. I, have talked with foundation organizing meetings of the People's Summit, and they probably won't be able to organize it in Paris for reasons of security. So to some extent, the, ter the terrorism attack and all what is around here, including surveillance, has a really <coughs> big role, uh, just to, for us to have that in the background of our minds. But I'm starting from the IPCC, which is the intergovernmental government, oh, panel on climate change, and I will start with their recommendation for mitigation, analyze them under the current growth regime, and suggest that this is probably not going to work very well, and that we have to um, un understand how the current growth regime works and to challenge that. And then I will move from bad news 
the good news in terms of perspectives and transfer transformation. So if we read into the IPCC, the key findings of the new synthesis report, um, it's obviously that um, climate change is anthropogenic, um, that the consequences are going to be more and more severe, and that there is a chance to do something about that. I have a quote from the synthesis report of the IPCC. I give you a few uh, seconds to read through it. Um, we are not affected equally by climate change. Some will be affected in a more severe way. And not only across countries. In, increasingly, I am using this terminology global north and global south in a less geographical sense because we have global north in the global south, if you consider the new upper middle classes in India and China and Brazil and other countries, and we have increasingly global south in the global north if you consider, consider the increasing inequalities in the so-called countries of the global north. So I think we should use these words in this political, political meaning. And the global south in this meaning is going to be dramatically affected by climate change. Um, this is what we know, so I'm rushing through this. It's not only about CO2. You will know it's not only about CO2 emission, it's about a bunch of other things that we are emitting to the atmosphere. This is, these are slides <coughs> that I just copied from the IPCC synthesis report. They are available online. Um, when we talk about sources, there is a multiplicity of reasons for anthropogenic climate change, and this is just one uh, brief representation of the main causes for anthropogenic climate change. And this is another slide by the IPCC about the impacts of climate change in different areas. Uh, and if we consider the increased displacement of people, this is happening now. It's not only the war in Syria. If you consider uh, the, environmental, uh, uh, the environmental change that has happened in the Middle East and in Syria, there are environmental reasons for the civil war in Syria as well, which we shouldn't forget. Um, it's, the, the, the news is even worse than that. Climate change is only one of the planetary boundaries. And there are other things that are happening which are as bad as climate change. Of course, they're interlinked. This is a, uh, you can, I have the link here. You can watch if you don't, are not familiar with the discussion about planetary boundaries. It's a, um, it's a research based uh, in Stockholm um, about how we are kind of, uh, going beyond the boundaries of the carrying capacity of our planet. And there is more bad story, bad news about that. This is another uh, research, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, who is kind of connecting and showing the relation between the socioeconomic trends and the Earth system trends. You can go and look it up online and go into the details of all these very small uh, figures. Now, I'm moving on onto the recommendation that the IPCC makes. Uh, the IPCC is positive about mitigation, and I think it's important to consider that, because some of us has already given up on the possibility of doing something about climate change, and I'm talking about adaptation, and that's important because it's about equality, but it's also about the fact that there is still a lot that we can do. And these are the, the four main recommendations that the IPCC makes. Uh, about how to ad uh, address climate change. I'm going to analyze each one of those recommendations under the assumption that the system in which we are, which is a capitalistic growth-based system, doesn't change. And uh, trying to show that if we were to follow the recommendation of the IPCC without changing some of the main element of this system, this is not going to help much. So let me start with the first one, more efficient use of energy. And a shift from, uh, to, towards low carbon and low carbon energy. Let me give you some examples. For example, the shift towards hydropower. It's a renewable resource, right? Uh, there is not very much CO2 emission attached to that. Well, I could show you a lot of um, examples of how, why this is a problem. I just have some links here about that and some on biomass and biofuel. So let me just, excuse me about that, sorry about that. 
um, show you some of what is happening in the world. Um, this is an amazing page. I don't know why the picture doesn't load. But this is a project that has been funded by the European Union. I don't know where they funded that project. But <laughs> sometimes these things happen. It's called EGIL, and it's a mapping of global environmental conflict. So this page is amazing because you, you can search for global environmental <coughs> conflict using different filters. You can search for region. You can search for type of resistance. You can search for company against which this is being organized. You can search for who is uh, who are the main actors. Just to give you, there is a brief description of what is going on. This is a huge dam right by hydroelectric plant on the um, on the Bio Bio River in Chile. And then you have a description of what is happening, what is the environmental conflict about. You have some basic data. You have the type of conflict, the project. You have the company involved <coughs> in the conflict uh, and where they are. And you can search for the companies as well. This is a project being done together with NGOs um, based on the framework of so-called post-normal science, the idea that knowledge does not only come from university and from research, but that you need activists on the ground to generate knowledge. And they have been cooperating with activists on the ground and using this very platform for a network of different groups uh, fighting for environmental conflict. So this is just one uh, example, and I, and I have many others here. This is an agri-oil plantation in Indonesia. Um, this is, is used as, uh, you can use it as carbon offset, so you can even have a, a certification that is sustainable, because you plant, right? It's a project of reforestation. Um, and you have different organizations which are part of it, the financial institution involved, among other, it's a, 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 um, supported by different uh, institutions all over the world. And it is supported by the round table on sustainable palm oil. Um, so this is sustainable, right? This is something that gets a label on it and you can use it for your carbon offset uh, if you want to invest in it. This is renewable energy. Palm oil is biofuels. It replaces fossil fuels. But that, at the cost of deforestation of pristine forests, evicting, again, the people who were leaped off the forest in this very place. And you can go on and read about about the, the, the details. I'm not going into the details. I'm just giving you that opportunity. And you can, if you want, go back to all these links and check them. Um, and check them um, online. Um, there is a Greenpeace report that gives you more in, information about what is called certified destruction. destruction. Certified because it is certified by all these people, different, different international labor organizations about sustainable, uh, sustainable investment, um, about um, shifting towards biofuel, etc. So if you look into these, you, you see what is the shadow side of uh, the move from low carbon to no carbon energy. Let's move into to the second recommendation that the IPCC made. Um, uh, reforestation and carbon off offset markets are the best example for improved carbon sinks, right? Well, that we have to deal with the very same thing. Um, in Uganda, there is a project which is called, it's a tourist plantation project by, um, a, a, um, by a, a society which is in Norway, which is green resources um, um, in Norway. Um, so this should work better now. Yeah. So this is how they present themselves. Um, they are labeled as sustainable. Um, it's a society in the global north in, 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 in Norway. Uh, it doesn't look like that here. If you look into that, it looks like as if it were based in Africa. And they replant. They replant forests. Um, they are being supported and labeled and encouraged. I'm sure if you want to, if you fly and you want to buy your um, carbon offset, you will have the green resources as one option to invest into. Well, this is what is really happening in the place, is that, they, again, 
they're replanting, which means that there have been deforestation before. This replantation is just done up from the point of view of the economic, economic revenue. The local people are not involved and, not in, and are not, don't have a voice in this project. Again, they are being kicked out of their own land. And we could go on and on forever. Consider <coughs> Red Plus. Does anybody know Red Plus? Oh, this is a great project, uh, which is uh, really considered the frontier for green investment. The Red Plus is, a, is a, sh a shortcut for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Um, Red Plus is uh, uh, about uh, shifting investment towards plants for reforestation. The only problem is that if you consider only the carbon offset of trees, you know, palm trees are just the same as pristine forests to a certain extent. Um, if you don't consider the complexity of forests and you just consider the carbon offset contribution, then um, whatever plantation you have will have, give you not only the carbon offset but also a bunch of other, of other chances. And there is a monitor of Red Plus um, showing how dangerous it is in its current form precisely because it is affecting um, the local economy, the local people, <coughs> mainly indigenous people. I'm not going into the details, but um, you can go on this page and read some of the reason why Red Plus is not, is not working. The zero fossil emissions is not about carbon offset, it's about reducing fossil emissions. This is one thing. Offset postpone structural change and may even damage the climate goals, which is happening with uh, plantations. Redworks is a great in theory. Making work on a big scale in reality is a huge challenge, precisely because mainly uh, the structure of the countries in which this is being implemented is related to high corruption. Uh, so there are no stru government structure that can guarantee that it is implemented in a certain particular way. We all know how reality works. So it might be great in theory, which I don't even think it is, but in practice, it's just working uh, in the other direction. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so another example, I'm not opening this, this page, but if you're interested in knowing more about what wetland banking is, it's another great example for carbon offsets. You can gain credits in uh, restoring a wetland um, and put your credits for that wetland in a wetland bank, which will allow to you, yourself or someone else to buy these credits for doing some infrastructure construction somewhere else on a wetland. Um, it sounds crazy to me. Um, in most cases, the unit of measure of wetland banking is acres. So the surface of the wetland. There are some models in which they try to consider qualitative criteria about the specificity of a wetland, which is not just the number of acres. But in most cases, it's very difficult to quantify into money this qualitative criteria. So what happens in the end? Is that you know you, you do a wetland, you destroy a wetland somewhere else in the world, and have a restoring pro pro <laughs> project in the U.S. and you're fine, and you can go away with that. Um, let's talk about more efficient use of energy, which is the next recommendation from the IPCC. Um, this is the narrative that we can decouple uh, economic growth from the impact on resources and sinks, right? Like carbon sinks. It has happened. We have decoupling, we have relative decoupling. So you have less energy and less stuff going to one unit of product because of technological improvement. This is happening. What is, isn't happening is absolute decoupling. So you have less energy and less stuff going to one unit of product, but the total amount of products increases constantly. And there are structural reasons for it. One is the so-called rebound effect, and I'm sure you have heard about that. But people usually talk about the rebound effect on the side of consumers. Like you have a more efficient car, it uses much less gas, so you can drive longer distances. Or you save money, which you can invest for a long distance flight. And this is what people basically do, or you buy a more efficient refrigerator, and the old refrigerator, which is still working, it goes in the basement and is still being used. So the total amount of energy that you're using increases and doesn't decrease. Um, but the rebound effect is not only on the side of consumers, 
but it's on the side of producers as well. <laughs> if you as a company invest a lot of money in new technologies, in new green technologies, you have to take uh, um, money for the investments, so you're indebted, you have to pay that back with interests. You're very much interested in having your products, which are more efficient, which are green, and mirror your great green technology, you're very much interested in selling a bunch of these products on the market because you have to cover your costs or to generate dividends for the shareholders. So the very logic of the system eats up the gains for um, green technology. There are some examples where it hasn't happened that way, but overall we are still <coughs> on that path. If you consider the so-called inbuilt obsolescence of products that we artificially reduce the life cycle of a product. Like most cell phones and smartphones could have a life cycle which goes over 15 years. There is no problem to that. It's technically feasible now. It's not being done, of course, because the profit would be massively reduced if Apple or what, whoever else were to put on the market every 15 years a new smartphone. Can you imagine that? It's not going to work. This is a graph that I take from my colleague Francois Schneider from Barcelona trying to explain how the rebound effect works. It's not only about resources. So you have a more efficient technology, and this is where you end up with your more efficient technology, so you could reduce the total of production, but what happens is that. That works also with, with time. Maybe some of the people sitting in this room have experienced the transition from uh, letters to emails. Most of you haven't. But I can tell you that it was an incredibly efficient revolution. In one unit of time, you could, you know, in that unit of time, uh, instead of just writing those letters, you could, you, you, you need much less time for the same amount of communication that you had before. So we could have reduced our working hours, right? It didn't really happen. What happened is that we intensified our working investment, the energy that we bring into work. So there are sociological studies showing that for those privileged to have a job, um, that the job has been getting more and more intense in terms of the energy invested on the job. This is called efficiency. This is called rationalization. And this is what it is. Um, let's address the last recommendation by the IPCC on the individual level, life and lifestyle and behavioral changes. Oh, I'm not saying this is not important. I think it's crucial. I'm just giving you a sense of what it means under the current system. So let's talk about a dietary shift. Let's talk about becoming vegan, which is happening in our countries. But what happens to is that if you look, for example, <coughs> to graphs about the meat export, I'm not saying for a minute that it's not important to follow a vegan diet. <coughs> I'm just saying that we are in a structure in which if there is a reduction on one part, profit will seek a different channel to keep going. And then we have to address that as well. Um, I don't think we have the time to listen to this beautiful radio feature from a German radio, because it's too long, but if you want to do it, take a chance for it. What happens in Europe? Most people like only parts of chicken. They don't eat the whole animal. So what happens with the part that we don't like? They are being exported to Africa. And they destroy the local economy, where people tend to have chicken uh, in a kind of local and sustainable way. But this is, or selling them on the local markets. But that's more expensive than the very cheap chicken being exported from Europe, uh, produced by industrial farming. So going back to the IPCC, why is it that they are so obsessed about using economic growth as an argument for mitigation? They are showing that climate change is dramatically affecting economic growth. They are showing that it's better for GDP growth to start investing money into mitigation rather than going for a business-as-usual model. 
because this would reduce dramatic economic growth in the long term. So why this obsession on economic growth? Well, I would say that what makes weak the IPCC is that, that they appeal to the logic of economic growth. And this undermines their very mitigation goals and adaptation goals. Something that I have already said, they're showing that we're moving towards a global catastrophe, but we have to make sure for whom and where a catastrophe is now already happening. And that might not affect us here in this country, because um, we might keep our economic growth in the US going at the expenses of other places and other countries. So, by what I'm, as I'm going to suggest in the second part of my slide is an alternative to that, which is called degrowth and comes mainly from Europe. I'm going to say a few words about the structural role of economic growth and then moving on to the proposal of degrowth. Um, the proposal of degrowth is not just about economic shrinking. It's not about taking the paradigm of growth and reversing it and saying we have to start shrinking. It's about a detoxification of a logic, of a paradigm. Uh, the degrowth activists use this metaphor of the elephant. It's not about put, getting the elephant of economic growth onto a diet, because it's not going to work. It's about transforming the metabolism of the elephant, which is the metabolism of our societies, into something else. In the metaphor, transforming the elephant into a snail. Maybe zoologists would say, wait a minute, the snail has a strong metabolism. I don't know. It's not, it's, it's not taking literally. I don't know about the metabolism of a snail. But you get the idea. So why growth at any cost? Why is growth so important? It is terribly important. It has a fundamental role of stabilization in our societies. Um, economic growth has been essential for securing and increasing prosperity. Uh, for poverty reduction, we need economic growth to address unemployment in our current system. And for tax revenue, we have ha have witnessed a constant reduction of taxes since the 60s. Um, so if you don't have economic growth, uh, any basis for whatever welfare state might still be in place um, is not going to work. You need economic growth to support welfare state measures in our current system. And it has been essential for political stability and social pacification. You have a growing cake, you don't have to redistribute, you distribute the growing surplus. So you reduce the social conflict. Economic growth was magic in that. And it also created so-called output legitimation of democracy. Output legitimation means that a democracy is not le le legitimized by us participating as citizens on setting up that very democratic structure is legitimized by what it can <coughs> promise to you, but the promise that can hold in terms of your well-being. So the legitimation is related to what you get from it and not to your participation, your input as a citizen. And growth has been great for that. This is the metaphor that I use. I would say for our societies, economic growth is like a crazy bicycle. A bicycle has to keep moving in order not to fall down. This is a hamster on a bicycle, so this bicycle is not only that has to keep moving, it has to keep accelerating. When we talk about economic growth, we talk about growth rates. This is, in the metaphor, an acceleration, a constant acceleration. If the bicycle stops accelerating, it falls down. This is why some sociologists say that our society, modern societies stabilize themselves dynamically by acceleration. Um, and this is why it's not just that our societies have economic growth as a characteristic. When I talk about our society, I'm talking about industrialized modern societies. They are growth societies. They are fundamentally based on economic growth. The problem is that they're running into limits. Not only because the ecological limit, as the IPCC shows, is impacting economic growth, but because the very logic of the crazy bicycle and the hamster on a bicycle jeopardizes its own conditions of reproduction. If you keep cycling and never do maintenance, your bicycle would eventually 
stop working. Um, we are in a double crisis, ecological economic double crisis. More growth in, increases the impact on the ecology and on our life as well. So more economic growth is not leading to more quality of life, it's reducing our quality of life in the long run. So going on on a growth path is undermining society's condition of reproduction. Um, I'm going to, the next slide's going, just giving you a few ideas and then moving on to the positive news. Um, but you can have a look at the slides if you want. What happens now is that we have, we, we are reaching the point in which this crazy bicycle is no longer working, but it is not true that it is no longer working for anyone everywhere. Um, it's important to keep in mind that growth is the magic wand which stabilizes our society, so there is an interest in pushing it forward, pushing the limits in order to keep growth growing. This is the other picture. You kind of expand the limit so that you have more economic growth. Expanding the limits can go in all possible directions. The highway which is being, I think is being built right through the Philippines, is that right? They are right at the point in Bolivia, which is one of the largest biodiversity spots of Earth. Um, they, are bu they are building a, a highway there. This is not just a highway which is already a terrible impact for the region. It is increasing the possibility of accessing resources to which you didn't have access before. So infrastructures, larger infrastructure, it is, a, is a measure for expanding the capacity to exploit. But it also goes into the human direction, creating new needs, continuously creating new needs. The whole advertising industry is shifting the borders, shifting the boundaries of growth beyond, to keep it going. The deregulation of the financial market is a way of shifting the limits. And you could go on forever. I, I'm not going into the details, but I think that the whole debt politics um, that is keeping growth going is exactly this, pushing, pushing the limits. Having people buying beyond what they can afford to buy. So there is indebtedness, and that's very functional. And you can go on. Um, pushing the limits shift the burdens onto others, or otherized others, those who are made into others, marginalized. Through this idea of the global north and the global south, in general, in space and time. So we, what we are witnessing is that others are bearing the burdens for our shifting and pushing <coughs> the limits. And the future, we are pushing into the future. Future generations are bearing the burdens of what you're doing now. And this happens not only in other countries, but it happens in our countries. Um, we are witnessing a very strong destabilization of our democracies. Um, Greece is the best example of what it means. If you take the bicycle example, if you have a society which is all constructed around economic growth, it stops growing. It collapses. It falls down it enters into a crisis and a stagnation. And we could go on and on about what happens uh, in terms of the consequences onto others. I don't talk about poverty, I talk about destitution and misery, because poverty as such, well it sounds kind of crazy if I'm talking about that as a woman living in the global north, you know. But poverty as such must, doesn't have to be a horrible thing, if you leave poverty in a dignified way, this is what Gandhi used to say, get off the poor's bed. Leave them alone. They have a way of finding a dignified life and autonomy and self-determination. I mean, I don't want to push it too far because, you know, I live here very comfortably. And I don't want to say your poverty is nice. The problem is that the logic of development, the Western logic of development, instead of helping people getting out of poverty, is transforming poverty, which might be a more dignified way of life, into destitution and misery if you evict people from their own territory. And they have to, like in India, go to Mumbai and live literally on this little green stripe between the, uh, the, the highway lanes. 
you're not really helping them out. Um, okay, I'm skipping some of the points here, um, and I'm skipping these two, just mentioning that if we just consider degrowth in a literal sense, so stopping the bicycle going, we end up in crisis. This is not the message of the degrowth movement. It's not about keeping the bicycle and the hamster on the bicycle as it is and stop accelerating because this will increase inequality in our societies, will really bring us into a dramatic crisis. Um, so what is degrowth? Degrowth is a radical, is a project for a radical social transformation. The idea is that you have to change the bicycle. Because that bicycle, the structure of our modern societies, works only if it keeps accelerating. And if you stop, that acceleration is going to fall down and most people marginalized will be affected. The only way is to change literally the structure of that bicycle. This is why I like this picture. This is a completely different bicycle. It doesn't need to keep accelerating. It has room for different types of people and even for a dog. Um, it can stop, it can go slow, more slowly, without entering a crisis. Out of the metaphor, it means that we have to radically change basic institutions of society because they're all oriented and based on economic growth. What are basic institutions? The institution of labor or paid work. What is distribution or redistribution? How does education work? Production, urban planning, time politics, and I could go on. Forever. The degrowth people use this motto. They say, your recession is not our degrowth. This is not what we need. We don't want to enter recession, which is just stopping the bicycle. We want a radical change in social institutions. Um, and this is a kind of an alternative motto, if you wish, in terms of an alternative path for a democratic, just and solidary stabilization of society. Um, I'm skipping this. Some people would say that degrowth is in French a mot au but, a projective word. It's a kind of a word that attracts people because it hits the core of modern societies, um, of modern industrial societies. It unveils the contradiction of, of the growth logic. Um, and it's even more than a traditional critique of capitalism. Uh, if you consider that so-called socialistic countries were as growth fixed as uh, capitalistic countries. We could discuss about what capitalism is, but so to, at a superficial level, um, it I, I, I addresses both logics. Um, it undermines the traditional legitimation of economic growth and, so, and, and kind of claims that instead of the output legitimation, so growth and the democracy being legitimized because it gives you something and improves your quality of life, shifting the legitimation on the fact that you participate. It's you who decides how things work. This is input legitimation of democracy. Self-determination and real democracy that controls the economy and is not controlled by the economy. And it is a radical question not only of the economic and material structure, but also the cultural legitimation of that material structure. Um, you might say, how is it going to, to work? Well, there are many signals that we are in a phase in which this might work. The crisis, the last crisis, and we're going to enter a new one soon, um, the financial crisis, uh, kind of broke the idea that growth is going to improve your quality of life. There is a disillusion going on. Um, the idea that your children will have a better life than yourself is no longer really credible, is it? Most people will say, I hope my children won't have a worse life than I have. So it's kind of breaking down that legitimation. And people that work according to the expectation, work hard and you make it, are kind of realizing it's no longer working. So they, I, I kind of adapt and I correspond to some ex social expectations because I hope that I will get me to a point in which I will have a better life for my children, but then it doesn't happen. So this promise doesn't work anymore. There is a kind of idea that there is something wrong about that. 
And there are a lot of movements who are really working hard in making clear that this is the case. I'm not going into details about that, but there are different kinds of social and environmental struggles all over the world. They are kind of conveying this message. And there is what I call fresh curative social experiments. It's not my word, but I think it's very important. So initiatives in which people try to anticipate the, the, the society they would like to see in place. And they do it in the way they relate to each other, in the way they do what they do. It's not just, it's not a traditional social movement against something, which is also very important. It's about starting different types of living together, starting projects in which you kind of, in all the contradictions of the present, try to live the way you want the society to be in a certain and this is very important to empower people. I had a feeling, I was yesterday at the library listening to this talk about climate denial in terms of daily life denial. I'm not saying that climate change doesn't exist, but just not being able to cope with that. I think there is an amazing wave of desperation going on. People are desperate because they don't know what to do. And the only protection that they have is <coughs> I don't want to hear What? The, the moment of empowering is important, and I'm going to give you some by, uh, examples about what I mean. I think that the power of the degrowth movement is that it can bring together antagonistic types of struggles <coughs> with these prefigurative initiatives. Those who are ready to fight, the climate camps activists who are blocking <coughs> places uh, in Germany, uh, we had a very successful merging of degrowth activists and climate camp activists that were blocking a coal, a coal mine. Um, so it's not the same people, right? But it's important that these people kind of interconnect and enter a network. You won't probably have the same kind of guys doing transitions town and blocking a huge machine for uh, coal extraction because it's different kind of people. But they might cooperate and learn from each other. Why not? And I see a great potential of alliances. For example, the Indignados movement, which is the version of Occupy that you had in Spain, uh, was very strong connected with, envir with environmentalist activism. And that was very important to have that connection. It was the main moment of that. Um, Having connection between more antagonistic squatting projects, I have Barcelona in mind as a good example of that, with less antagonistic forms of reshaping the structure of the city or of the town where you live. Usually these are two groups of people who don't talk to each other. What if they start talking to each other? What if they start cooperating? What if the squatting project is embedded in the neighborhood, supported by the people who won't probably go and occupy a building, but they can work together, and that could be part of something that shapes uh, the alternative neighborhood, and so on. And there is already alliances going on between degrowth, which is basically a model for the global north, a model for rich countries and the rich parts of the poorer countries, with movements in the global south, such as the anti-extractivism movement, which is very strong in Latin America, the weather debate in Latin America, and so on. Um, I'm closing with some examples um, of what can happen. I think what is going on already is that we have to rethink, for example, cities. Cities are parasitic places. They are completely parasitic. Energy is produced elsewhere, food is produced elsewhere, and the pollution goes elsewhere. So rethinking cities, making them more resilient as places in which this asymmetry of exploitation has changed is essential. It needs a radical change of the structure of the city. We have a lot of projects of sharing. I in Kovalis, there is a lot of that. Sharing as consumers, which I think is totally important. I think it's not enough. I think that we have to move from collaborative consumption, in which we share the use of a car, in which we share tools, to collaborative production. The city have, can become a, a place for production, production of energy. We do have that here, too, with a project of you know, solar panels on the roof, but it's kind of 
if I own a house, I don't own a house, so I can't do anything about that. I can't put solar panels on my roof. It's an individual decision, and it's totally important, and it's supported by the community. But there are models of reappropriating the energy production in the place, so we are allowed to consume as much energy as we can produce in the place where we are, or other forms of production. Um, the, the city of Hamburg has re how do you call it, anyway. Uh, the energy production has been privatized and citizens came together and decided to buy back the main uh, energy supply, supplier, which is in the hand of citizens, not in the hand of the local government. It's in the hand of the citizens' cooperative, and they are organizing that themselves. They're about to be, and this also on the joke. Um, we can learn from the poor. We're not the best one. I don't, by the way, I don't think that the change will come from us. I think we should get rid of this idea of taking leadership in the world, in the global north. I think that the global south is much better off in terms of knowing where to go. They don't have the power. But I think we should learn from them and support them. It doesn't mean that we should stop being active and doing things. But I think we should start thinking that it's not us who will be leading the change. In fact, you do have in some favelas forms of self-organization and self-determination, but all contradictions, and power relations which are problematic. But this is a place where you can learn. The transition sound movement in the global north, I think, is a very interesting project. There are different modes of transition towns. The idea is to create, render a town or a neighborhood for that matter, in the long run, independent from fossil fuels. <clears throat> there is a lot going on already in Carvalis. The idea of transition sound is to coordinate <coughs> all these different activities into one big strategy. And it's really interesting. What I think is really the great possibility that we have is the new commons movement. This means a different way of production. It addresses production. We are beyond the age in which mass production is, is needed. It is Framed as needed because it creates huge amount of profits for large companies. But we are in the place in which technology might lead us to a transition in which you could have a globalized exchange of ideas, open source, not related to copyright, and a decentralized local production. This is possible. This is already happening. It's still parasitic, but any new perspective starts with a parasitic mode towards the current system. So these are some of my favorite examples. The open source ecology um, page in which it's really about um, building um, machines which are which construction is so you, we all know open source about softwares, right? Have you thought about open source like this? This is possible. Awesome. You can build a mas machine open source base. It's still parasitic, as I said. Most of this is based on aluminium, and aluminium is something that is very hard to produce locally, but we can recycle a lot of aluminium. So there are ways to go, and there are perspectives beyond that. Um, or something which I think is great is the peer-to-peer -peer foundation. Uh, which is also analyzing the peer-to-peer -peer production as something going on in that very direction. If you want to check that, it's really interesting. The new model of the carbon engineer suggests. The commons movement is not about commons as we are used to, to hear that, common goods. It's not about goods. There are no common goods unless they are made into common goods. The atmosphere is not a common good. It's a public good accessible to everyone. Making the atmosphere, the air, into a common good means starting a different way of relation among each other and way of relating to the air and the atmosphere. So it's not common, it's commoning. Commoning is a process. You transform something into a relation, a horizontal relation of common management of that resource. And this is happening today. Commons is about a different form of relation. Uh, and it's a, this movement is amazing, it's going on all over the places. And I conclude with this uh, in, incredible example of the Catalan Integral Cooperative. <coughs> the Catalan Integral Cooperative, I 
what you see here are quotes from their website. It started during the indignados, during the, the, the top of the crisis in Spain, the financial crisis. So people started getting together, founding a cooperative, not just as a nice activity for uh, people, educated middle class people who knew that it's important to do something about the environment, but it really started about connecting environmental and social issues to help people survive it in the crisis and bringing to them some fundamental basic services. Um, the, the, the page has been also translated into English recently, which I think is great. Um, and here you find a bunch of different pro projects. Of course, they have a local currency, and they combine uh, antagonistic and prefigurative moments. The antagonistic moment is what they call uh, occu uh, Occupy, uh, who is it? Sorry. Occupying Banking. Eric Durand is starting <clears throat> taking credits from different banks up to 500,000 euros and he paid that back and this is the money that he used to initiate the cooperative. I think he ended up in jail, but that's what it's, but this is what that was exactly his message, and he attracted a lot of people supporting that. It's about why is that a crime? Is not what banks are doing the crime? No, it's just the old, uh, old way of thinking of it. So they had this antagonistic moment of occupying banking related to a bunch of other solidarity uh, production of basic services, food, clothes, but also health. And when being in this country, I come from Germany, so I'm kind of scared about how the health system works in America. So there is this, this movement around social medicine, and I, it, that is based um, all over the world, but basically, if you look in the global south, where it's most, most needed. And I was thinking, but we need that in the U.S. <laughs> I think there is so much need of it. And there is a lot to be learned. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm basically done with suggesting you some of, of the ways to go. What I, my, my last thoughts are about the fact that I think that these social experiments are not something that has to be scaled up. It's not about making them bigger. It's about and networks among different social experiments globally. They work because the, the Integral Cooperativa wouldn't work if it were bigger. It works because it's in Barcelona. But it could be connected with other similar projects and presses of the world so that you have a learning process going on and an alliance. Not only learning, but also being alive if things get really bad in terms of meeting more antagonistic struggles. I think that pla these places are where you can, we can go to live and experience that a different way of life is possible now. And we need to experience that to get beyond our desperation. It's a moment of, ex of empowerment in which we can reappropriate our own desire. Our desire has been appropriated by capitalism, by economic growth, and by the advertising system. Reappropriating desire means to creates protective spaces in which we can start discussing what we need and want, we need and want, and not what we are expected to need and want in order to keep the system going. So it's not about desiring stuff, it's about desiring the condition under which stuff is product, produced socially and environmentally. And that's, so I'm concluding here without entering that. I think that the message is reclaiming and regaining control over and transforming the framework conditions for a good life for all. I would say this is what the Big Group movement is about.